Tonight, we'll be talking about liberty activists arrested here in Keene, New Hampshire. We'll also be talking about a proposed law which would allow people to sue the federal government if they feel they've been damaged by global climate change. We'll also be getting into the downsizer dispatch and a whole lot more tonight on Free Minds TV. And welcome to a brand new edition of Free Minds TV. It's episode 106, where we challenge you, the viewer, to think outside the box. With you, as always, is Toby. And Nick. We have a lot to get to today. We're going to be getting into some national issues and issues from all around the world. But first, I wanted to start locally, keep it local here in Keene, where there's a whole lot of liberty activism going on. I think this is actually making some national headlines around the world on blog posts around the internet. And it's having to do with liberty activists being arrested for what started off trying to let the world see what's going on in a public court. Now, some courts, it's actually up to the discretion of the judge whether they're allowing video cameras and audio devices and other um, equipment into the courtroom to document what's going on in a so-called public court. And here in Keene, New Hampshire, Judge Burke, the presiding judge, has decided that, well, he's going to be banning such cameras. Videographer Dave Ridley from The Ridley Report, who's been on the show and we've talked about multiple times, was arrested for just doing that. A couple of months back, he decided he was going to be bringing a video camera in and going to be videotaping a public trial. Because, I mean, freedom of the press, right? It's the First Amendment, the right to a public trial, the right to the press, freedom of speech. Well, Judge Burke said, you're not allowed to bring a video camera into my courtroom. And Dave Ridley was arrested before he even made it into the court. He was in the lobby, and he was videotaping. He was arrested. Well, he had to go to court. He had to appear. And what happened? Well, it kind of took the focus off of, off of him because several other activists were arrested. Uh, Sam Dodson from the Obscured Truth, Net Truth Network, he was the first to go. He decided he wanted to bring in his camera and video uh, what was going on in the courtroom. He, again, never made it into the court. He was arrested in the lobby of the court. And then Eli Rivera, the prosecutor in Keene, New Hampshire, told everybody to leave the lobby. Everybody who's not involved in the case must leave. Several activists, at least five of them, were arrested, and at, two, at least two summons were given for people failing to leave. I don't know if it was too quickly or too, uh, too slowly, I don't know, or just them refusing to go, but they were arrested for it. Yeah, and in New Hampshire, it's, they are supposed to allow cameras in the courtroom. The judge is given some discretion uh, when it comes to, say, um, a rape case or a case involving a child. That's the only reason, th when the law was passed, that they were given any kind of discretion to limit press access into the courtroom was if it was sensitive information in a case like that. But they're applying it broadly here in Keene, New Hampshire, to simply keep cameras out of the courtroom in general. Um, and I believe this has been applied to people who aren't liberty activists, so it's not just people who are part of the pro-liberty movement who are being affected by this, but anybody who wants to take proceedings in, in the King Court. And it it's is not just the King Court. It's, we've seen evidence of it going on in Milford here in New Hampshire as well, and I'm sure it's going on in a number of courts across the country. But here's where activists are actually standing up, and it's getting some press attention because they're willing to get arrested for it. Most people, when the judge tells them, shut off the camera or you're going to jail, will shut off the camera because most uh, rational, sane people don't want to go to jail. But liberty activists who are fueled by freedom, who want to point out the atrocities of the government, are simply doing just that through civil disobedience and keeping the cameras rolling and willing to get arrested for this. Now, is this what tax dollars should be going for? Is this what the government is for, to arrest people for trying to videotape a public trial? I would say absolutely not. It's a waste of money. I don't want my money, my tax dollars, going towards arresting these people, the, the trials that they're going to have to go through, jailing uh, and housing some of them uh, behind bars for this. It just seems asinine, a waste of money. Uh, there were some of the comments that were left. Uh, if people want to learn all about this, it's all up at freekeen.com if they want to get the full story behind this and all the blogs uh, about people who are arrested and other people commenting on it. But one of them said, uh, commented that a lot of the police officers thought it was just as crazy as we do. They thought that it was the police and the judge who were making a big deal about this. And in reality, uh, no one's doing anything wrong. People are simply trying to record a public trial. Now, what reason do you have to bar a camera from a public trial? Uh, like you said, Nick, these laws were made in the cases of, of rape or something where there's sensitive informa information trying to keep people's identities secret. But in cases where you're talking about, say, speeding tickets in a district court, really small offenses most of the time, a lot of them not even crimes, 
why should you be banning a camera from the courtroom? They shouldn't. And unfortunately, it, it's gotten to the point where it requires people to be willing to get arrested to get coverage on this. Because Americans have been so accustomed to their civil liberties being trampled on that when a judge bans cameras from a courtroom or denies you your right to a uh, public and speedy trial, people just don't care. It, to actually get it out into the press, it takes people standing up and getting arrested. Well, I think a lot of this stems back to, well, the court's been embarrassed on a couple of occasions. Ian Freeman was the main video that made it out with uh, Judge Burke uh, telling him, sit down, sit down, and then he was arrested. I mean, it got thousands upon thousands, uh, over 50,000 views on YouTube, and after that, the, judges the Judge Burke decided, well, no more cameras in my court. I think what he's actually doing is just fueling more of the same. I mean, people are moving to key New Hampshire specifically because of this. So if he wants to get rid of the liberty activists and have them leave his courtroom alone, well, he's doing it the completely wrong way. I mean, if he wants people to leave him alone, well, he should treat them with respect, as he did in the past. But lately, he's just having the hard fist approach, which is just getting more people to move here. And he's going to be encountering more of this, I suspect, in the future. All right, we'll report on this. If you want the full story and uh, read comments, get involved in the discussion, freekeen.com. But we must move on. Let's move on to a video that you went out and did, Nick, with the Motorhome Diaries and getting the story about people who are traveling the country, uh, people from Keene, actually, are traveling in the country to teach people about liberty and freedom. Yep, um, and I talked with Jason and Pete from MotorhomeDiaries.com. Their website doesn't have a whole lot to do with the fact that they're in a motorhome, but what they're doing is traveling around the country trying to spread the word about freedom and liberty and networking with uh, like-minded people and like-minded groups. So uh, b besides coming here to New Hampshire for events, they're also going to Los Angeles, I believe, for the Atlas Foundation's uh, is having some kind of a conference and they're going to be traveling all around the country um, in this effort to educate people about freedom and liberty and talk to pro people who are already members of that movement trying to reduce the size of government um, and just kind of set the tone for more coherent activism and spreading the message so that we get new people involved with that movement. Um, and they've both become Keene residents as part of the Free State Project. Yep. Uh, so Keene is their home base, even though they're going to be traveling around the country a lot over the next, I'm not sure how long it's going to go on, but at least for the next few months, they're going to be mostly outside of Keene, New Hampshire, trying to spread the word. Um, and the Free State Project is one organization that is sponsoring them. Uh, so they're going to kind of be covering the RV that they're in with advertising. Um, for the Free State Project and other uh, organizations that are trying to advance individual liberty. Um, so I talked with them a little bit. Let's take a look at the video and see what they had to say. I'm here with Pete and Jason of MotorhomeDiaries.com and you guys are traveling across the country trying to spread the word about freedom and liberty. Um, what exactly is it that you guys are doing and when did this whole journey start? Well, uh, this official journey in this RV, which we've done dubbed MARV, the Mobile Authority Resistance Vehicle, began this past Saturday, just uh, five days ago or so. And uh, the first leg took us from Northern Virginia to Keene, New Hampshire, which is now our home base. Uh, it's, the, it's the hotbed of libertarian activists. We just got uh, our driver's license, and it uh, says Keene, New Hampshire on it. The uh, We have a temp tag right now, but uh, that's uh, that's a New Hampshire plate. And uh, so, yeah, this is uh, this is home, especially after this week. Uh, we just went to a Sunset Point and, uh, with some of our uh, our new friends, and it's, it's gorgeous. We were able to look at the entire city, um, and I, I love it here. But, yeah, but past that, uh, we're going to leave tonight. We're going to head west. We have to be out in L.A. by the end of the month, so we're going to... Uh, drive west and stop in a lot of the big towns, big cities along the way and, and meet with people in our networks, people who've emailed us and, uh, you know, are, are uh, fans of freedom basically just to con hopefully connect them and share some ideas with them and document their stories and share them with other people. Uh, we've been lucky because, um, as a lot of keen people note, that uh, this is like um, a really good communications hub. I mean, your program for sure, uh, Free Talk Live. Um, we, we've it's all... report. Right. Yeah, really report. Nearby, yeah. We've been uh, promoted by um, a lot of these venues, and so we hope to return the love, um, you know, on a national level. Um, we're going to wrap this RV in logos. The back of it is going to um, be an advertisement for the Free State Project. So follow us to the Free State, New Hampshire. We figure if we do good work, then people are going to want to support us, and so uh, we give people that option as well. Yeah, we're going to be, we're fortunate to know uh, people at other organizations that have a lot of good people in their networks, alumni, 
uh, supporters and things like that. So we're going to be working with some some uh, people uh, in those instances and also uh, people in our personal spheres that we know uh, through our pr previous gigs. But we also want to reach out to you know individuals that are fighting the good fight, that are standing on their principles and pushing back against uh, pushing back against you know statism basically and and taking a stand for freedom. And now's the time because we just uh, finished eight years of a horrible presidency and then we see a lot of those policies continue with this uh, new administration and people are fed up. Uh, you know, tax days rolling around, there's going to be all these tea parties. Um, you, you can just tell that a, a lot of people are just sick of uh, the, the way government is growing and all the bailouts for uh, corporations. Um, and so we want to capitalize on that, you know, but we want to be able to show them, hey, there's another way, you know, um, let's uh, put less emphasis on government and more emphasis on a voluntary society. So aside from shows like ours, how are you guys getting the message out about what you're doing? We're using plenty of new media tools. Um, we have uh, all the videos are going to go up on YouTube. Uh, we're going to, you know, do uh, Twitter messages, uh, blog posts, of course, um, Facebook uh, fan pages. So people can reach us through that, but everything goes through our uh, website, demotorhomediaries.com. And so again, if people are interested in what Jason and Peter are doing, go to motorhomediaries.com to get involved or just read the stories as they travel around the country. All right, we must move on, Nick, and we'll be covering them. I'm sure well, they might be even on the show again when they get back. They are from Keene now, or where we're broadcasting some. So I'm sure it's not the last we'll hear of them. And hey, who knows? If you're around the country, maybe you'll see them. But let's go outside the United States. Let's get away from all this local stuff and pick on some other countries from around the world. Let's go over to Poland. Poland. Now, Poland has some of the strictest laws about drunk, drunk bicycle driving on the, on, on the books. I mean, here in the United States, we also have some strict laws. We treat uh, drunk bicyclists the same as we do drunk motorists. Uh, they can get a fine and a little bit of jail time. But in Poland, it's a little bit more strict. And Poland's constitutional court has recently upheld a ruling that drunken cyclists should be treated exactly the same as motorists and face prison time if caught. Now, while we do have the exact same laws here in the United States, the penalties, well, they're just not quite as strict. In Poland, you can be go to jail for up to two years, as well as have some pretty strict penalties simply for riding a bicycle drunk. Now, a lot of people might be saying, well, this probably isn't a very big deal. I mean, uh, how often are people getting arrested for driving drunk? Well, here in the, uh, on a bicycle. Here in the United States, it's more likely you're going to get arrested in your car. But in other parts of the world, people don't use cars as much. And in Poland, a lot of people use the bicycle to get around. And there are currently 2,000 people behind bars in Poland for riding a bicycle while intoxicated. While most of them are getting the full two-year sentence, most, the average sentence is nearly a year at 11.5 months. So a lot of people, a lot of tax money being used to hell, uh, hold drunken cyclists behind bars for making the decision to ride a bike while drunk. Now, here's the deal. Yes, driving drunk, probably not a good idea. And if you're getting behind uh, a motor vehicle, you're putting other people's lives in danger. But when you're uh, driving a bicycle, you're more harming yourself than anyone else. And should the people who are riding a bike be held to the same standards as people who are driving a car? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I mean, the worst thing you could do on a bicycle that could possibly endanger public safety, and I think it is a bit of a stretch, is maybe you're drunk so you swerve your bike into traffic and cause an accident. But the same argument could be made about somebody who's walking and is drunk and could step out into traffic and cause cars to swerve and cause an accident. So well, it doesn't seem to me that riding a bicycle while intoxicated should be treated like drunk driving at all. Right. I mean, in Poland, people who are walking while drunk can also face arrest. I mean, but it's not quite the sta same standards that are held to them. You're, you, you're cited for walking while drunk. Uh, critics of this, this law have argued that, well, you're both using muscles to walk while drunk and pedal a bicycle while drunk, so maybe we should treat them the same. The high court, though, says no. You can face up to two years while, for driving a bicycle while drunk. So to me, it seems a little ridiculous. I think they should be treated a little bit less dangerous than those who are behind a motor vehicle, but hey, at least we're not in Poland. We do have some. Well, but well, you can. I believe you can be cited for riding a bicycle. But you're not going to go to jail for two years, where you may in Poland. No, you will you lose your driver's license though, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Because well, you, you don't need a license to, dr to drive. Uh, drive a bike or ride a bike, so I guess you can continue down that road unless they're going to take that from you too. Well, anyways, we're running low on time, so we got to move along here and uh, let people give people the opportunity to let their folks in Washington know. 
their representatives, so-called representatives, know what's irking them and what they should be doing to help the cause of freedom and liberty. And we do that almost every week with the Downsizer Dispatch. Nick, what's on tap this week? Um, well, this week they're talking about a survey that was done by the Physicians Foundation that finds that nearly half of primary care physicians plan to eliminate or reduce their practices over the next three years. Now, why are doctors planning on doing this? Well, they have a lot of the same complaints about the healthcare system that Americans have. Too much non-clinical paperwork, difficulty get there, having difficulty getting reimbursed, too much government regulation. The fact is that also the fact is that they have to deal with insurance companies a lot. And as, you know, as a consumer of medical care, not being a doctor myself, I am irked by the fact that medical care costs as much as it does. People complain about that, and they, a lot of people are trying to use that as a justification for the government to get more involved in the health care system. But that doesn't seem like a very good answer when you consider that the government funds half of all medical care in the United States as it is. And since they've gotten more and more involved, not only funding medical care, but also regulating insurance, they've created a system which creates poor service, lots of paperwork, and very high costs. How do they do that? Well, if you look at, for instance, the fact that health insurance is tied to employment. That was created by government programs and tax incentives, which encouraged businesses to start offering health insurance as opposed to just paying you more and letting you find your own health insurance. When you've got businesses incentivized to pay more for medical insurance, you've got the government driving up health care costs by essentially footing the bill for people who are getting, you know, multiple unnecessary medical procedures. Many people on government assistance are getting unnecessary health care procedures. The fact is that just causes the doctors to have to pay more because they have difficulty getting reimbursed from the insurance companies and they have difficulty getting reimbursed from the government. If we didn't see so much government involvement in, in health care, uh, you would probably see a lot of people paying for routine doctor's visits out of pocket. So if you're concerned about you know, the, the high cost of health care, go to downsizedc.org and sign up for their system. Let your representatives know what you think about uh, how we should address the health care problem in the United States. Sounds good to me. All right, we've got to take a break, but when we come back, we are going to be getting into a, a Quebec story about a daughter, a 12-year-old daughter, who sued her father for grounding her. And one will be bringing you the details as well as some news about global warming, all that, and a whole lot more. Stay tuned. This is Free Minds TV. Free Minds TV is brought to you in part by Life Productions for your basic and semi-pro video production needs. From full wedding and event coverage to DVD authoring and distributions, lifeproductions.com, that's L-Y-F productions.com. <laughs> well, thank you, Spencer. This is Mark Edge from Free Talk Live, and you're watching Free Minds TV. And welcome back to Free Minds TV. It's Toby here with you. And Nick. And we'd love to invite the viewers to log on to our website, freemindstv.com, is where you can get all the archives, ways to help the show, all the show content posted on the forums, and a whole lot more, freemindstv.com. But for now, we must move along. We are going to be getting into the story about uh, a daughter who has sued her father for grounding her, and one, it's pretty ridiculous, coming from Canada. But first, let's stick to stories here in the United States and get into some government borrowing and the repercussions for it. What is, what's the latest? news, Nick? Um, well, as you know, the government is spending a lot of money that it doesn't have in terms of tax revenue, so it's borrowing a lot. And there's concern that all of this government borrowing could start to crowd out private borrowing and private investment. Uh, this is coming from CNBC, so it's pretty mainstream. Um, there's concern that the influx of cash that government borrowing will push into the economy will cause inflation, which isn't a surprise. When the government prints more money, you tend to get inflation. But that will likely lead the Federal Reserve to increase interest rates, which makes it much more difficult to borrow. So the government's borrowing a lot now is going to make it very difficult for regular average people and businesses to borrow money in the future. It's going to make it at least more expensive. Um, and Michael Pento, from the, uh, he's the chief economist at Delta Global Advisors, he says the prescription of massive debt and of money printing, of re-leveraging the economy, is exactly what engendered the depression of 2008. You're, um, and all of the remedies are the same virus that killed us. So we had a, a massive deleveraging because of excessive debt that was created by government policy. And the government decides that the best policy to fix that 
is to re-leverage by creating massive new amounts of debt. Basically just blow up a new bubble with as much paper money as you can print. And that's not likely to work for very long. That's one of the reasons we saw inflationary policies right after the dot-com bubble burst. And it was a relatively short period of time from the crash of the dot-com bubble until we saw the real estate bubble burst. So even if they can manage to prop up the stock market and inflate their way out of this for the short term, we're just likely to see another credit bubble pop in the future. Well, a short-term problem for a long-term solution sounds like the government to me. And I'm sure we'll be reporting more on this because, well, we're far from over. We're far from out of this mess that the government's gotten us into. But we'll continue as the stories come to us. But for now, let's move on. Let's go over to Canada. We haven't picked on them for a while. But their legal system is getting a little bit ridiculous, especially when it's coming to parental rights. This story coming from Quebec, where a dad was sued by her uh, a dad was sued by her daughter after he grounded her. Um, he grounded her because he had instructed her not to go on certain websites on the internet. He caught her going on these websites. He alleged that she was posting inappropriate pictures of herself. So he grounded her from going on her sixth grade class trip. Well, she decided to bring him to court for this. She used uh, the, her parents were divorced and she was living with her father who had complete custody rights. But she used her mother's divorce attorney and brought her father to court over grounding her. And the court ruled that yes, she was allowed to go on the class trip overruled her father's grounding, which seems to me he's a parent, right, with parental rights. His daughter is using the inter internet and what he deems inappropriate seems like he has the right to ground her. But Quebec court says no. Uh, he brought it to appeal and the appeal said no. And at this point, the father and daughter relationship is completely ruined. She's seeking custody with her mother now and it's uh, destroyed the relationship. What irks me though is where are the parental rights? He had full custody of, her do of his daughter. She's doing something that he, she, he instructed her not to, posting what he deemed inappropriate pictures of herself on the internet, and the courts have ruled that he doesn't have the right to ground her for that. What? Well, I think the problem is that, the root of the problem is that government tends to see itself as a second parent for children, and in the end, government tends to see itself as better at raising children than their actual parents. So we've seen an erosion of parental rights uh, in favor of the government ta taking more and more control over what parents can and, not, can and cannot do with their kids, uh, essentially the government is trying to take charge of parenting. And we've seen that, I mean, the government schools were the first step in that. People just handed their kids off to government schools largely because it was like free daycare. And so the government's in charge of, if your kids are going to public school, the government's in charge of your kids for almost half the year during the day in most places and now they're just trying to insert themselves into the actual home even more than they already have. So I'm not surprised that this trend is continuing in Canada just like it is in the United States. But this is disgusting. I mean when I was a kid I could get grounded for any reason and it was my parents telling me you're grounded and it didn't really matter and I never would have thought to bring them to court about it. it just seems ridiculous. Uh, yeah, like you said, the government taking over parental rights, uh, taking over parenting, not a good idea. But for now it's time to move on and pick on the United States again <laughs> and its fight against global warming. I think they changed it though because things aren't always getting warmer. It's now global climate change because as we know the weather does change and certain climates do change as well. And now you may be able to sue over it if you deem that you have been hurt by such. Yep, uh, the Washington Times is reporting that a provision in a bill authored by um, Democratic representatives Harry Waxman of California and Ed Markey of Massachusetts would allow global warming victims or people who expected to be damaged by global warming. Oh, expected? You don't even have to be victimized? Yeah. Well, that's what the article said. If they expected to, so I guess they could prove that they have a reasonable belief that they're going to be damaged at some point in the future. Um, but if they've been damaged by global warming, th this bill would give them standing to sue the federal government in court for damages. A little bit tricky when you consider the fact that tornadoes and hurricanes and all kinds of nasty weather events have been with us forever. As long as people have been on the earth, we've had calamitous weather events. And that was supposedly, you know, most of that happened supposedly before there was man-made climate change. So how do you distinguish natural climate change from man-made climate change, and how do you say that the climate change caused the particular hurricane well, that hit you? I, I mean, I, I think it's if you want money enough, Nick, because, you know, I could think up some reasons I'm being damaged by this evil global 
climate change. I mean, I, I saw that you can sue for up to $1.5 million, and you can not only sue the government, which is us the people, because who's going to really be paying for it? Well, it's us the taxpayers, because when you sue the government, well, where do they get their money? They get it from you, the taxpayer. So you're suing your, the people, essentially. And you can also sue businesses as well for it. So you can uh, collect up to $1.5 million. I mean, it's some pretty nice money. I think I've got some reasons down in the future. I was going to create some businesses that, due to global climate change, I'm a little bit nervous about having my business here, because what if a hurricane comes, right? Can't do it. I could use some money. I can just see this be, I had this legislation been in place before Hurricane Katrina, I could see thousands, or if not tens of, tens of thousands of people who were you know, put out of their homes by that storm trying to sue the federal government for damages. But the fact of the matter is the federal government didn't cause a hurricane. And I think that's it's policies, did Nick? It's an important thing. It's to keep policies in mind. caused it by because they didn't put strict enough regulations on businesses, and they supported uh, things that caused this global climate change. So well, it is their fault. You know, they're going to try to make an argument like that. They're going to try to make the argument that we wouldn't see such severe hurricanes if it wasn't for global warming. But who's to say that a large right. hurricane wouldn't have hit Louisiana had it not been for global warming? There's no way to say that. So, and I personally, I think that the man-made influence of global climate change has a negligible effect on things like hurricane patterns. So, I, you know, personally, I think that we can blame nature for hurricanes. Well, but we can always that, sue nature. And next. this is still a bill. So, if you're, you know, if you agree with us, don't want to see it passed. Um, you can still try to lobby your representatives, tell them you think it's a bad well, idea. Well, it's got some serious support. While it's still a, bu a bill, there's several uh, uh, prominent government officials that have signed off on this, and a lot of people think that it should be signed into law. Because it just seems like it's, it's, it's total insanity. It's though. just irrational policy. It's complete insanity, but hey, it hasn't stopped the government before. I mean, they do insane things every single I'm day. I'm not confident it will stop them this time. Even with all the, you know, the scenarios that one can come up with when they pass a bill like this, that seem to point towards the idea that, hey, maybe this isn't such a good thing to be passing. They're but it'll have a nice name. It. It'll have a nice name, like keep the earth clean or something, yeah. and it'll, it'll look all nice. I mean, we already know that the representatives don't read the bill, so if it has a nice name on it, if uh, the right people scratch each other's backs, well, this could just become law, which would be completely disgusting and insane, but hey, it hasn't stopped them before, like I said. All right, well, we're out of time today. We have more articles, but I guess we don't have time for them. Uh, it's been Toby here with you. And Nick. We'd like to invite you to log on to our website, freemindstv.com. From there, we have all the old archives, uh, ways to help the shows, the forum, all our sh uh, show content is, uh, content is posted there, and a whole lot more, freemindstv.com. Until then, take it easy.